Um, I'm here uh, with Scott Hagley and with Martin Robinson, and we're gathering to have a conversation around Scott's late new book, which is called Eat What Is Set Before You. And as we jump into that book, Scott, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, you are Canadian, spent a lot of time in Canada, but you're now in Pittsburgh. So talk a little bit about that journey and what you're up to. Yeah, so thank you, Martin and uh, Alan, for the invitation uh, to talk about my book. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm glad you think I'm Canadian, Alan. I'm actually American, but I just oh. live in a long time. You look Canadian, Scott. Yeah, mm -hmm. see, I, I'm, I'm honored. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, uh, I teach at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, uh, teach missiology, and oversee a program that we have in missional leadership, a doctor of ministry in missional leadership, as well as a church planning and revitalization certificate, um, and then also teach in the master's curriculum here. Um, but before coming to Pittsburgh, I was a pastor at Southside Community Church in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia for many years. And um, Southside's an interesting congregation because it's a, a church of um, neighborhood-based missional communities. And, and, and being involved in that church was what connected me actually, Alan, to your work and, and Martin, your work, and began um, in the early 2000s just raising a, a number of questions that um, led me to go to seminary and and into a PhD um, and work with organizations like Church Innovations and, and St. Paul, as well as Forge Canada. Um, all, in all of my work as a pastor, as a consultant, as a researcher, I'm just deeply interested in the kinds of relationships congregations need um, to develop, um, to connect with what God is up to in their neighborhoods. And um, seeing that question as a critical missiological question for the church and post-Christendom. Um, so, uh, um, anyway, so that, that, um, research and, and, um, you know, interest, uh, shaped my PhD, shaped my work with congregations, now shapes the academic programs uh, I'm a part of here. Great. So, talk a little bit about, out of that interest, that passion for the church and the local, uh, Talk, talk a little bit about the intention of this book. A local leader, pastor picks this up. What's the intention? And what does that intention have to do with the title that you chose? Yeah. Um, so I'll start with the title. Uh, Eve would have said before you, um, at the risk of sounding like a cookbook or something like that, uh, is... Uh, it comes out of Luke 10, which is a text that I know many, uh, many folks in the missional church conversation, many folks in the um, drawing from asset-based community development work in relation to the church will be familiar with, um, with Luke 10 as a text that just provides a kind of theological imagination for what it is we're up to. Um, but but he what is set before you is, is the instruction that Jesus gives to the 70 as he sends them out two by two to the places where he is about to go. And, um, and it's a way of embodying or enacting the dependence upon the hospitality of those to whom uh, Jesus sends them. And, uh, you know, in a lot of churches that I work with, we, we want to do the healing of the sick, or we want to do the preaching of the gospel. Um, but the first instruction is to uh, remain in one house, to receive the peace of the person there, and to eat um, what is set before them. I also like that it that it's an instruction that's just deeply embodied and we all have an intuitive kind of immediate understanding of how eating what is set before us is risky and can be threatening, um, can evoke or um, provoke a kind of crisis. Um, you know, will I, um, what will happen to me if I, you know, if I, if I eat this, if I take this into my body? Um, and it seems like that, that crisis moment of, of um, not being in control of the, of, of what's been placed before us and um, entering into that risky space of depending upon or receiving the hospitality of another, um, that that is a, kind, it is a kind of visceral thing for congregations. And so I liked um, that as, a, as an image as well. And I think it describes the story and the journey of Midtown uh, quite a bit or quite well. Mm. Um, in terms of the, the intended audience or the hope for this book. I, I talk in the introduction about a conversation I had with someone who became a friend in the course of my research. 
uh, who I call Ruben in the book. And, um, you know, Ruben was a, a kind of, um, uh, he, was an, he was an insider, an informant for me, an insider that helped me kind of interpret what I was experiencing in the church. He was both an outsider and an insider, had married into the congregation, but had been a part of it for a long time. And um, Ruben and I would have lots of conversations about, um, you know, what I was learning and, and what I was participating in and his experience of the church. And I got to the end of the research that, that helped me then write my dissertation. And, um, you know, I'm finishing the dissertation and he says to me, okay, so what? <laughs> what does this mean for us? And um, I remember feeling fairly tongue-tied um, that I had done an ethnographic uh, description of the congregation and the life of the congregation. I had a lot of thoughts about where I thought life was in the congregation and, and um, what was um, really remarkable about this group of people had come to love this, this place and these people. Uh, and, and yet, um, in terms of trying to, you know, offer something to their, their elder board, here's what I think you should do. Um, I just realized how complicated that, you know, when you do a deep dive into that, um, into the life of a, of a people and how that life of the people is connected to um, the history and the life of a neighborhood, um, there, there's just multiple levels. And so it, it took me, um, years of, of kind of peeping through some of the material that emerged, um, from the book, um, uh, that emerged from my research, years of working with other congregations, um, to sort of take this story of the congregation and then feel like there was, um, a way to tell the story that, that, um, could allow other congregations to see themselves in the life of Midtown, but could also point to the cultural, uh, the leadership, the theological um, implications for um, Midtown's story. Um, so that, that's really, my, my hope is, is uh, that um, folks like Ruben um, and Ruben himself, I've, you know, I sent him an early draft, um, can draw from Midtown's story and see their own story within it and see the, um, the possibilities for renewed theological imagination around the mission of God in their neighborhoods, um, can see some cues and some clues for the formation, for, for ways of reforming our, our leadership that's more attentive to culture, uh, more attentive to questions of contextualization, and that there's some practices, particularly the practice of hospitality, practices of placemaking, that, um, you know, that they, there's some, um, some ways that the book can land and help uh, congregations practice that in their own way, in their own context. Thank you. It, it seems to me, uh, and you can correct me, that one of the ways you want to come at being, I mean, what I hear you saying is, is um, I want to take all the work I've done and, and really wrestle with the question of how it actually lands on the ground for many of these congregations and their leaders. And one of the, one of the words that you use uh, fairly extensively to get at that is the, is the language of crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's used in multiple ways. But I, want, I wonder whether you want to talk a little bit about how you are seeing this language of crisis, which is obviously the experience of many churches, becoming actually a, an important space in which to eat what is set before you. Yeah, yeah. I um, I wrestled with whether to to use that as as a kind of primary metaphor, um, and and I think it landed for me thinking about my own work as a pastor, and how easy it is sitting around the the the, um, the team, you know, the pastoral team. Um, how easy it is when you're around a table of other leaders to. Um, to take this confirming information and to find a way of marginalizing it or minimizing it because it makes us anxious. Right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. this, this person or this question or this problem in the congregation, um, rather than, um, rather than bring it into uh, the, the, the circle of conversation and to ask questions around the, what God might be possibly up to in this, um, uh, this cue, you know, that, that sort of doesn't fit the, the story that we're telling, this narrative cue. Um, 
rather than bring that that issue into the circle, we find ways of marginalizing it. You know, oh well, um, that person just didn't really understand us, and that's why they said that, right? Or um, you know, this um, partner in the neighborhood just, you know, is is uh, um, you know, they just don't care about the neighborhood as much as we do, or you know, whatever. And realizing that we do that out of anxiety, we do that to minimize, um, you know, uh, to, to minimize the kind of discomfort it might create. Um, and yet, the times when we have sort of invited that voice into, um, into our discernment or asked questions about what God might be possibly up to, um, on the other side of, of that sort of crisis is the possibility of, of of new imagination of new life and and things like that i i have one story i tell when i work with my students it's not in the book um but uh, a woman that was in our neighborhood in vancouver who um came to our church um, um wanting us to help her write a letter to to ask for um uh, to apply for a grant from the city of burnaby if she wanted to hold a festival to celebrate the inclusion of, of kind of outsiders in the neighborhood. She herself was a refugee. And so we helped her write the letter. She was our neighbor. And then she came back with another invitation. Um, well, now if the city's gonna give me money, we need a nonprofit to send the money through. And so, well, okay, I guess that's, we can do this also. She kept coming back with more and more invitations. And before we knew it, our church was totally embedded in the project of this woman who's not a member of our church. Um, we had no idea where it was going and it created a lot of discomfort. You know, our, we're on the line for this thing and who knows where it's going to go. And I remember the day of the festival standing in a park in Burnaby, British Columbia, looking around at, um, you know, 800 to a thousand faces of people that I did not know or recognize that, that were there because of connections that this woman and these other organizations that she was able to draw together. Uh, brought together. And it became this beautiful invitation of our church into a set of relationships that we didn't pursue. We had no ability to seek out on our own. Um, but it came as the result of a kind of, um, a kind of a crisis. And so, um, so I like, you know, the way David Bosch, um, which I don't even know if it's good uh, interpretation of this Japanese character, you know, that he talks about in the beginning of Transforming Mission, but there's the character that says uh, crisis is both risk and opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think whether that's good linguistics or not, I mean, I think that that's at least a nice uh, metaphor for kind of holding what, we're, what I'm talking about. And it, it seems to me that um, if the mission of God is dependent upon the hospitality of those to whom we are sent, um, and if the action of God in the world is not just through the church, but the spirit of God has been poured out on all flesh, and that part of the task of the church is to continually discern um, what it is that God is up to um, beyond the, you know, our immediate, the immediate four walls of the church, and that to form community around the mission of God in the world, um, then these, in, these interruptions, um, these provocations, these questions that are pesky, that might lead, you know, that, that can create a kind of crisis or make us uncomfortable, that at the very least, these are worth attending to. And so I, I, you know, I, give, I offer three categories uh, of things that we might attend to. So attending to the crisis of call. So the ways that our encounter with God don't always match up or map onto our imagination for God. And how do we learn how to attend to that? And so discernment becomes a key practice for that. Is that, is that the, that's the part where you, the Cornelius and Peter interaction? Yeah. This is called? Yeah. 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 So, you know, Cornel, um, yeah, Cornelius and Peter, um, uh, you know, Acts 10 and 11 is, is I think a paradigmatic story in, you know, for Luke's telling of, of the early church yeah. in the book of Acts. Yeah. Um, and and it's, an, it's a direct implication, I think, of, of the pouring out of the Spirit on all flesh in Acts chapter 2. And, and so, you know, P Peter's way of leading through that is this, what's at stake in this isn't just the inclusion of the Gentiles, but a different imagination for the gospel, right. a renewed understanding of what God is up to in the world. Yeah. Um, and so that is, there is a kind of crisis, uh, obviously, that that, I mean, the, in some ways, most of the New Testament is wrestling with that question. Um, Scott, do you think, thinking about all of us who write books, um, we often talk about the agency of God. Um, do you think there's a bit of a tension for all of us um, 
in that process whereby the very fact of writing a book kind of tends towards actually here are some answers folks um which actually then tends to remove the agency of god and points us back to well here's what we can do <laughs> do you did you feel that tension at all yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean yeah because you know there's there's this there's this tension i think even when you're working with a congregation to say um you know, God is, um, you know, that mission is about the agency of God, right? And it's not about the things that you do. And the life of the church is contingent upon the, the agency of God. Um, but the fact is we still have to have programs. Right. And yet, but, and yet the, the solution, um, you know, in the end, you still want people to try something, right? Yeah. And so there is, the, the, you, you know, saying it's dependent upon God shouldn't lead to a fatalism. And yet, um, you know, it often probably leads to a kind of activism that then crowds out um, the, the initial kind of theological insight. Um, and, and I do, I mean, I, I mean, I hope the book doesn't seem formulaic because my hope is that it, it is that this isn't, um, here's Midtown's journey, here's how they navigate these crises and these are now three things you can do um, my hope is that it evokes, I mean, this is why I like the language of theological imagination, that it evokes possibility for people, um, a renewed sense of trust and hope that God is not finished uh, with the life of our communities and, and, and that there's a, there's a as a, my, one of my teachers, Pat Kiefer, would say there's a preferred and promised future. You know, God has a preferred and promised future for these congregations. So. Yeah. Thinking you've, you've given us a, a, a very nice story that isn't in the book, Thinking about the book itself, is there a particular story that you think does encapsulate maybe some of this tension that we've just sp spoken about? Can, is there something that comes to mind that you would say, actually, this was quite important as a story within the book? Yeah, um, there was a group of, um, this is a very activistic church um, with conservative theology, which made it a really interesting combination. Um, you know, lots of neighborhood partners that weren't always um, attended to theologically. They were attended to kind of more practically. Um, and yet there was some distinct work of God that was happening in these partnerships. Um, there, was, there was a group of, of uh, college students that lived in a community house just down the street from the church. And uh, the church owned an abandoned lot between the house where the college students lived and then some other houses in the neighborhood. And this is a lower income neighborhood, um, very diverse, uh, very much in transition at the time I was doing the research. And the college students had this idea that they were going to get the permission of the church to, um, to till the land, you know, to turn up all of the grasses, weeds and whatever, and uh, expose this, you know, rich, dark soil and grow vegetables. And they were going to grow the vegetables and then they were going to, in partnership with the kids in the neighborhood, and then they were going to give the vegetables to these families. And uh, so they went about growing all the things that you would expect 20-something um, uh, college students to grow. They were growing kale and other kinds <laughs> of microgreens and, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and so they, they, they get to the first harvest. And to their um, amazement and horror and um, maybe a little bit of offense, no one in the neighborhood wanted the stuff they were growing. Nobody wanted any kale. No, they didn't oh. want kale. Um, oh. You know, and uh, they were like, this isn't even good lettuce. What is this about, right? And, <laughs> and so, um, there was a, there was a, a there was a, a, that was a kind of crisis moment right, for these students, our, our goodwill in the neighborhood didn't produce the kind of result that, that, um, that, that, it sh that we thought it should. And um, they had a decision at that moment, right? They could, they could have um, said, well, these people, you know, these people in the neighborhood don't really know what's good for them, or, um, you know, they, would, they could dismiss it, they could have abandoned the project. And instead, they just started asking questions and tried to understand what had happened. And they realized that um, 
people in the neighborhood do cook with vegetables, but just not the vegetables that they were growing. And that the, the kids in the neighborhood, many of them had never eaten something fresh out of a garden before. And so there was just, there was a, there was just a, a there was a kind of a learning curve. And um, so that led to plans uh, going forward that were much more collaborative um, in the sense that they didn't just choose what they would plant, that it was, um, they involved the kids in the planting. Um, you know, they, they tried to partner with, um, you know, folks in the neighborhood to find out what kinds of things uh, families might want. And so it became a much more sort of uh, collaborative, you know, kind of, kind of project. Um, to me, that's, that's some of the learning curve that I think, you know, happens when we engage in this kind of work. Um, it also, I think, exposes um, one of the problems that I think a lot of congregations have, which is a, a sort of benefactor-client kind of assumption about yeah. mission and ministry. Um, uh, and, and I think it exposes, I think, some of the some positive habits that, that can lead congregations to, you know, eat, in a sense, what is set, set before them. Hmm. That's, um, you, you touched upon uh, where I, I wanted to go uh, next. Um, the, the, um, the, because again, running through the book uh, is your focus on the importance, the place out of Luke 10 of, and you use this language of being with people. And it's not, it's not an either or, but it's the being with, there's the primary relational encounter. And you go into this section toward the end where you are essentially doing a modern missiology of evangelicalism. Uh, and you use the language of, you know, heroic, activist, instrumental, um, within which you're, I think, you can correct me, you're, you're trying to say those, those forms which have been classic and, and are deeply embedded in the social imaginary are no longer going to engage the communities in front of us. And it's about learning how to be with. Uh, that's quite a shift. Talk a little bit about what you're discovering in terms of like take Midtown, how, how in your estimation, looking back, how did Midtown engage that and work with it? Yeah, so um, before I started working with Midtown, um, you know, maybe 15 years before, previous to that, the church had made a concerted effort uh, through a discernment process to remain in their neighborhood. Um, there was a lot of pressure upon them uh, because of denominational realities, um, because of um, it was a you know Swedish Baptist church, uh, primarily white, um, in a neighborhood that was becoming much more diverse, uh, and and the centers of the denomination had fled the city where they were located, um, and they uh, decided to remain in the city and um, and kind of doubled down on on that reality, and uh, as a result. Um, in partnership with organizations like the CCDA and others, you know, develop all of these kinds of programs, um, yeah. partnerships. Um, really remarkable in, in a lot like, of ways. Kind of like community development stuff. That yeah. Sort of yeah. They, you know, they had, they realized that there was a need for low cost, high quality daycare and they started a daycare and they had a food pantry and they partnered with other congregations in the city to provide overflow shelter for homeless families one month a year. And, um, and there was the only way that could be staffed. I mean, think about, you know, uh, September was, I think, usually their month. And so 30 days in September, they, they would, you know, have to have the church staffed as a homeless shelter. And, and um, it was, you know, uh, some really remarkable things. Um, by the time I was uh, working with them, studying them, uh, they were at this, one of their crisis points is that um, the immense uh, funding that it re was required for them to mm. do all of these kinds of programs was um, drying up. And so finances mm. were constantly part of the conversation. Um, younger families, it wasn't that it was just an aging church, it wasn't that typical thing that we think of with the aging church and just a huge gap and no young families. 
but young families, um, this is uh, 2009, 2010. So young families are, 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 have just lived through the, the housing crisis in the United States. Um, they're not making the kind of incomes. Um, they don't have the, uh, socioeconomically, they, they were not even giving 10% of their income or they're not gonna be able to, to fund what was happening. So there was this kind of structural um, financial sort of crisis. And, um, and so the, the anxiety in the church w was really about uh, what's gonna happen if we can't do all of these things and who are we if we can't keep funding all of these different kinds of programs and ministries. The learning that I had in spending time with these ministries is that the, is, was that the church had um, perhaps unintentionally um, rooted itself in such a deep way in the neighborhood that the burden of a, that of a lot of these ministries um, was being carried by non-church people. Oh. So their volunteer staff, the people that like gave their blood, sweat, and tears for it, um, people that were at the church building six days a week, they just wouldn't show up on Sundays because they deeply believed in the kinds of communities that were being created by these programs. And, um, and so to me, that there, was this, uh, there was this conflict between the kind of narrative that the church had inherited, which is... You know, I, I use I use the, I, I call it the heroic missionary narrative. Right, you know, yeah. that there's a few that um, if you think of the logic of the voluntary mission society, um, which is that there's a few that are extra special that are called to go do stuff, and everybody else is called to write a check and give it to them. And um, you know, it's a great division of labor. Um, it it's it's efficient and it and it's produced some really remarkable kinds of you know social goods. Um, it, it's also, um, um, it's also been a carrier of colonialism and it's been a carrier of page, page, um, the, and patriarchal, uh, kinds of frameworks and it's created benefactor client relationships. Um, you know, there's a whole sort of shadow side to it as well. Um, and so the, the church's kind of missionary imagination is that who are we if we can't write the check and send the few to go do all of these great things? Um, and, and yet the things that were happening were happening, um, in much more relational ways and the goods that were being, um, generated were goods of relationship. And so that caused me to go then searching for what's, what's an alternative. If God is indeed at work in this, what's an alternative, um, you know, theological framing. And this is where I sort of leaned back into, um, some of Samuel Wells' work, which I think is really brilliant and timely. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, where, where Wells um, wants us to reread um, the biblical story is it's not about human in, um, mortality, it's about human loneliness. Or, or the, 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 the good news of God is not about addressing human mortality, it's about addressing human loneliness. And that the primary message of the scriptures, scriptural story is God with us. Um, and that with is the performance of the gospel. So God is with us in Jesus Christ. And, and we, when we are with others, that, 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 is, um, that is a witness to the good news of the gospel. And I really think um, that is what was, the church was performing, but it, it wasn't always able to narrate that theologically because of the power of some of these other stories, some of these, some of these other narratives. Oh, okay. So what came out of all of that? What came out of all of... Of, of this tension between, well, we want to be involved in the community, but the community actually are doing it almost without us kind of thing. Um, so how did that get resolved or was it never resolved? What, what, what happened? So um, one of the things I'd love to do is go back and visit this church now. I mean, I sent, I sent, the, um, I sent an early draft of the book to leaders and do you recognize yourself in this? Um, any comments? And and they, they did, and they were affirming of, of, of what was written. But I, I'd love to go back and do some interviews now, um, you know, several years after the fact, to see how some of these things got resolved. I mean, I know um, one, of the, one of the initial solutions that happened, I don't write about it in the book, but that happened right as I was kind of winding up um, my, my work there, um, was they created a, a, a nonprofit, sort of a parallel structure to the church as a as a way of 
you know, they could apply for different kinds of grants. It was just kind of an acknowledgement that some of the things that had previously fallen under the, the banner of the church as a church ministry was now functioning kind of with a life of its own in the neighborhood. So that was a sort of structural way of, of recognizing that. Um, but, I, but I think some of the deeper identity questions when I was there um, were, not, were not resolved. Yeah. I mean, the question I want to raise in the book is um, uh, how, um, one of the questions I want to raise in the book is um, how can this life in the neighborhood, this life of being with others uh, six days of the week, um, how can that become part of the, ima the imagination of the church? Mm. You know? and, and I think it's a, that's a contextualization question. It's not how do these people become like us, which I think is the question the heroic missionary narrative asks. It's, um, um, it's how do we join with what God is doing with these people or how do us and them become a, become a we, right? Um, you know, and I, and I think again, the, the, um, you know, Acts 2 for me is a kind of paradigmatic picture here where you have, um, you have a kind of, uh, uh, you, you have a, um, um, you have a picture of, of diversity that is not, um, that is not reconciled, or that, that is not homogenized, but is reconciled, right? Do you think that's also thinking about Acts 2? They enjoy the favor of the people, but sometimes the favor of the people doesn't actually result in the kind of changes that you're hoping for. Right. And that can be a, that can be an interesting moment, can't it? I mean, I think I think of that in my own congregation, where I think we could say we have the favor of the people, but that hasn't resulted in anybody. Well, some people have become Christians actually, but but mostly it hasn't resulted in what you see in Acts two. Right. And, and, um, and that would be another, another part of tension in the research was um, some of the ministries feeling like if they didn't have a conversion story, they weren't being successful, which yeah. is another part of this heroic missionary. We are engaging in the world to make a particular kind of difference. And yet if I suggested to them, well, then, you know, are you saying that God's not involved here? And they would backtrack from that very quickly and say, no, no, no. Um, but they struggled to find language to talk about God's involvement that wasn't in this kind of noticeable, predetermined change. Um, and yeah, so I do think that's that's part of the the crisis that the the congregation was in. And I and I do think if we're going to enter contexts and neighborhoods, attempt to do what God is up to in that place, um, there is a way that our own agendas, our own vision mm -hmm. of what that change is going to look like, is going to need to be. Um, yeah. Uh, you need to be open to adaptation. So, there's That's, a um, sorry, Martin. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, in the midst of all that you're describing, Scott, um, and interest in your reflections coming in terms of the book itself, um, part of what I hear you saying is that what you you've, part of the tension is that there is an embedded narrative that you are describing as heroic activist and in instrumental um, as sort of benefact the client, that, that that's, a, that's an imaginary that in some sense defines the public discourse of the congregation. It's, it's what they agree with with each other. And you're not, if I hear you right, you're not saying that's bad, that that's wrong. What I hear you saying is that what it does, what it has been doing is that it, it basically um, drowns out the actual relationality that is going on. So it's not as if these terrible people in this congregation, all they wanna do is do their stuff to get people in. There is real relationality happening, if I hear you right, but it's not connected in any theological way to the core of what God is doing in and amongst and through them. I think that's what I'm hearing. <clears throat> I'm also, I think I'm hearing, and this is where I'd like your comment, is that that has been a very tough thing to change. Mm -hmm. 
And I wondered what do you want what do you want to comment on that part? Yeah, I, I would I, I agree with that. I um, in the same way that you can't um, paint the whole of the missionary movement with sort of one brush to say it was all universally terrible um, and tools of colonialization or it was all wonderful and you know I mean I, I think it's the, the relationships that the congregation has with the neighborhood are really complicated um, and, I, and I think the primary problem isn't necessarily that they're all doing bad things because I think it's a remarkable congregation and I said you know I came to really love this church um, do the research with them um, but, but it's that they, they lack theological, the theological imagination or narratives to name some of the really wonderful things that are actually taking place, that they, they have achieved, as I say, a perduring presence, you know, an enduring, ongoing presence in the neighborhood that is a kind of an achievement, a kind of gift of God. Um, and, and yet, um, it's hard for them to not see that presence as somehow instrumental to some other end, rather than a good in and of itself, a gift in and of itself. I think that the challenge of that is it involves a, a shift in theological imagination, and and it means um, it, it it means uh, letting go of or perhaps calling into question some really cherished narratives. That that hero narrative is a hard narrative to let go of, and the. Yeah the idea of taking back our city or being kind of agents for this kind of change or that kind of change um, is a really, it's a seductive kind of, kind of uh, story. And, mm -hmm. um, and it play, and, and, and I don't mean this as a negative comment on the church, but it, it place, those are stories that place us at, as somehow at the center of, of God's action. Mm -hmm. um, rather than maybe sometimes at the center, but sometimes observers or, or participants or whatever, right? And, mm -hmm. and so it's, um, so, I, so I think it involves loss, you know, um, to, to let go of this one story. And it involves um, uh, learning new language at times, um, learning um, new ways of telling stories. Um, I, I have a chapter that I begin with uh, one of my favorite short stories by George Saunders, The Tenth of December, where you know it's a it's a story uh, with an old man and a, a young boy, both of whom are kind of living in their own kind of narrative universe, um, and their narratives sort of crash, um, you know, uh, crash in relationship to each other, and yet they are able then to be. Um, kind of heroes in relationship to each other, but it's through their mutual need or it's through their vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I think something like that is, is the, kind of, um, the kind of challenge of, of shifting that, that um, theological imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing wrong with that, with saying this is a story which is not complete. Um, I mean, that's, that's fine because I think one of the lessons I've probably learned is that these things just take a little bit, well, not a little bit, actually a lot longer <laughs> mm -hmm. to any kind of new framework than we would possibly like. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's, that's part of the, the, the problem we live with all the time because um, how, do you, how do you wait for long enough mm -hmm. uh, for something else to emerge when we really have no idea what the time scale is or indeed what's going to emerge. It's, 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 um, that's where there's a need for a different kind of um, heroic story, I think. That's a, that's a difficult one. Which probably brings us to, um, I don't want to cut in uh, too much, but it probably brings us to that question which says, thinking about some of the reactions to the book, uh, what learnings have there been for you from some of the responses that you've had to what you've written? Before we get there, th there's a, a question I'd like to ask that will then get there, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. The, the, this, how do, you, how do you invite a group of people into a different theological imagination? Uh, so I don't know, like, goes to the core question of leadership, mm -hmm. which is itself 
living in its own crisis of identity and meaning. Uh, and ju just briefly, Scott, I wonder what some of your reflections are on what does all this mean for leadership? And let me give you an ex several examples from encounters I've had this week where pastors would uh, agree with what you're saying and their response becomes, well, we just need better discipleship. Uh, and then they have a method for that. Or another pastor sat down and said, well, yeah, nothing's going to change until these people sit down with me for a year. And I take them through this working stuff and they read these books and then they'll be different. And I'd be interested in your reflection on what are you learning about how leaders engage in inviting people into shifted imagination around what God is doing. Because my hermeneutic of suspicion says both of those approaches are just a pile of crap. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, your reflection. So in, um, in the movie Spies Like Us, um, Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd are pretending to be doctors and they're standing over a patient um, and the, the, there's a group of doctors that invite them to do an appendectomy. And so uh, Dan Aykroyd says the first step in a surgery of this kind is, and then he leans over the patient and, uh, sorry, Chevy Chase leans over the patient. Dan Aykroyd goes under the, 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 um, the table and is flipping through a medical manual. And then he comes back up and says the first step and then they go to the next step. And, you know, it's this, you can imagine the kind of disaster it is. And it seems like, you know, much of the time our approaches to leadership um, are very much like that. You know, James Smith talks about, you know, intellectualist ways of thinking about, you know, um, formation and things like that. And so we think, um, you know, we hear theological imagination and we think, okay, what people need is more information, right? And so, um, and a process and, and things like that. But, um, you know, so I have experiences often where I'll teach on something and people will say, oh, that's, you know, that sounds so good. Because who doesn't want to say God's at work in the world, right? And then they'll come to you with an example um, that's almost the exact opposite of the thing that you just talked about. Because to, to go from that all sounds really good to I'm going to now see the world through the, the lens of a, of a different story um, are two really different things. And, and so I, I think, you know, some of this move to practices language is, is, really, is really helpful, you know, out of, out of James Smith. So leadership is, is about helping construct particular kinds of practices, inviting people into a way of life um, so that body and mind and spirit are sort of all connected in this kind of journey together. Um, but, but I also think um, n none of us are wise enough or capable of constructing the right sets of practices to help people together. Like I think there's a, a new book out by Lauren Winner um, about how practices deform. It's called the danger of Christian practice. You know, so um, practices are are um, are, are good. Are, are good use construction of Christian practices can can actually um, uh, have have goods that aren't the goods that we think they might be. And so I think it's all really, really complicated. Um, and so this is why I, I, I like a, a, a couple, I, wa I wanna point leaders a couple directions at the same time. Um, the, the first one is to think of the task of leadership primarily as an interpretive or meaning making task, which isn't new. Um, I mean, that this has been said by all kinds of people, you know, but it's drawing from the sense making organizational sense-making literature and appreciative inquiry and some of these kinds of approaches. Um, and uh, um, and the, the wrinkle that I think I want to put on it is to, is to say that that meaning-making work is primarily improvisational, um, meaning that um, it's not like you're going to help shape theological imagination in your congregation um, by going away and then writing the, the perfect sermon and then bringing that out and now everybody's been convinced or by saying, okay, folks, now this is going to be our new congregational story. Everybody say it with me. Yep. But rather um, there's a kind of co-constructive element um, to the meaning making that is much like improvisational theater 
um, where you don't just, when, when something unpredictable enters into the life of the congregation, you don't just say no, but you do the over promise, or the over acceptance, the yes and, and then find ways of trying to weave that, um, see if it's possible or plausible to weave that into the story of the congregation. And, um, and, and that kind of, that, I think that's theological work um, and, and that's cultural work. Um, it's communicative work, um, and I think that's really important. Um, the the other the other element of the, the other piece is to um, is to think about the ways that um, uh, the ways that people's everyday lives are already can be already be rendered theological um, or or with God or before God, and so I, I want to encourage in our leadership a kind of maybe theological realism that God is actually really speaking and at work and present. And so if we can um, help people do in, enter into practices like the examine practices, mm -hmm. like dwelling in the word and dwelling in the world, which again, I, I I've just inherited from others. Yep. Um, um, but I think there's a way that those practices together can help form a theological imagination that isn't in the mind of the pastor or in the mind of the leader. That is a way of naming an act and an action and presence of God that's already there. Um, and and the, the third the third thing is I think there's something to the practice of hospitality um, as as another um, and again I this is I'm just borrowing from other people but um, to, to, the hospitality to me is both a practice that performs the gospel, you know, so somebody like a Christine Pohl would say, you know, hospitality is the essence or is, is a picture or an image of the gospel, that God in Christ hosts us. Um, and then we become through the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, God in us as well. And so hospitality is a way of thinking about the gospel. Um, but hospitality is also a practice that, um, uh, that shapes us to recognize and to receive and to participate in the gospel. So there's a the way that hospitality forms community as well as witnesses to what the community is to be about. And, um, and so this is back to the central image of eat what is set before you, which is a kind of image of hospitality. Yeah. And so I think thinking of hospitality as a kind of master practice, I, maybe I don't want to say master, I, I don't want to make too big of a claim for it, but thinking of hospitality as a, as a really substantial practice for this time of the church and and so you know the task of leadership is meaning making um, it's helping develop particular kinds of um, um, capacities for attending the God's presence in the world but I think it's then also trying to construct community or, or shape community around practices like the practice of hospitality and, and I think those all three working together in my experience as a pastor working with congregations learning from the work that you know um, you know, Alan, that you and Martin do, and, and what others, you know, I think those three together have a way of holding, uh, of naming the task of leadership for this time. Thanks, Scott. That's helpful because a lot, a lot of pastors listening here and looking at this book, these are going to be some core questions, but Martin, you are going to ask. Yeah, I was just going to ask, and thinking about all this, and um, whenever I've written, and, and I'm sure it's true for you, um, you, you then get responses to the book and you think, oh, yeah, actually, <laughs> that's an interesting point. Have, have there been any of those moments for you uh, where you've um, had some learning of your own from the responses that have come? Yeah. Um, I used it in a class this spring, which is really fun. And uh, so I had some students respond to it. Uh, and, you know, I think... Um, I think one of the dangers of a book where you're trying to do some theology, you're also trying to leave folks with a sense of, um, uh, so here's what it means for your kind of the practice of leadership or the practice of your congregation. Um, as people then um, tend to like read into that, sort of whatever that primary question is, which maybe happens no matter what, you know. So I, you know, I feel like there, there's, um, uh, I want to think more clearly about the link between um, the theological pieces I put er, uh, uh, on the front end of the book around um, thinking of mission as the suffering love of God 
in relationship to learning to become a guest in a neighborhood. Um, the, the connection between those two pieces, um, I haven't heard that reflected back to me in ways I would, I would like. Yeah. And so, so I, I feel like I want to think, think more about that. Scary stuff, Scott. <laughs> what? It's scary stuff. <laughs> Well, it is, and, and maybe suffering is the wrong metaphor, you know, so I've, I've wondered about that as well. Um, it, you know, that it may, maybe you have to work too hard to sort of claim that back as a way of thinking about a relational reality, being participating in a, a relational ecology, um, that we suffer one another, and, and, um, and that's what it means to be with another. Um, you know, I, I think... Um, I've been thankful for the responses from folks in the congregation that I that I studied that they're that they feel honored by what was written, um, and you know so I'm I'd love to explore more conversation with with folks around that. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to think if there's other, you know, I've had. Uh, I've had a few people at the end of this um, say, okay, so, so what now? <laughs> you, you know, which my book was supposed to be a response to that. So, you know, then you wonder, uh, yeah. you know, just trying to, trying to think, so where, what are some, you know, I know like in um, the missional joining God in the neighborhood book, you, you have that appendix at the end that right. is kind of a five step, you know, sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. I, resisted, yeah. I resisted doing that, but then, you know, I wonder there might be, What's the usefulness for, for something like that going forward? I, I'm, I'm hesitant of the programmatic at the same time. You know, I'm honored by the fact that people read this and they say, okay, so I want to enter this journey. What does that look like? That's the dance. It's a very hard dance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, Scott, thank you. You, um, in Eat What Is Set Before You, you have, I would say, pastorally, sought to engage all of the learning that you've been doing uh, and focus it on a particular congregation, but from the perspective of that last conversation, how does just a regular ordinary congregation in a community go about joining God in its neighborhood? And uh, I want to commend you for doing that and commend the book to people uh, because there's a lot in there. Um, and you can't answer all the questions because most of these questions, most of us don't know the answers to. <laughs> so yeah. thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, yeah, Martin, you. anything else you'd like to say at this point? No, it's, um, we're in an, an interesting moment in the whole history of uh, our interaction with something new that's uh, emerging, but it hasn't emerged. Uh, yeah, so it's still a bit of a puzzle for all of us, but um, yeah, engaging with the questions is just part of the process. So appreciate uh, your partnership in this journey. It's uh, really helpful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank, thank you Scott, both for the invitation. Yeah, well, thank you.